A warm welcome from Talk Walk. This is Minoli de Almeida, continuing the series on the psychosocial impact of post-COVID, which has plunged us all to some kind of depression with anxiety and confusion. This series is intended for us to overcome these issues and face the new normal. In this episode, we concentrate and we focus on domestic violence which has gone to great heights with the lockdown. While we empathize with the silent victims, especially the most unfortunate children who have gone caught in this wicked web of violence, we plead for justice for the perpetrators who are using the weaker sex as a punch bag for their wickedness. The only distinguishing marks that we find in abuse are black and blue. To our panelists today, we introduce Mahesh Senaratna, who is a criminal lawyer. Welcome, Mahesh. Thank you. Uh, thespian, and who has ex so much of experience in dealing with domestic violence. We have Sanjana Ravi, a social activist, aspires to be a catalyst for women's empowerment, having experience working at Women in Need with gender-based violence and currently pursuing a degree in law. We have Dinit Senaratna, a university student, a national award winner in athletics and an English announcer, a youth and peace activist. And Marine de Levera, I don't need to introduce her, a lawyer who won the most prestigious the award for courage in the whole world it was presented to her at the White House. Uh, she is the founder chair of Sisters at Law, a refuge center for abused women, promotes uh, alternative care for children trapped in orphanages. She uses visual art and dra street drama to create literacy to the public. She has her own street theater group that travels around the country performing plays related to the human rights. What a courageous woman indeed. Welcome to you, Marini. The only distinguishing color of abuse, again I reiterate, is black and blue. Shall we start with Mahesh? Hi, thank you, Minoli, for inviting me again. Um, I think a few important things that we need to understand when we are discussing abuse is that I think whatever I say I say from a point of privilege because it is most often it is not the men who are subject to abuse and it is the women that are subject to abuse and as as much as I don't like to use the term weaker sex and but that is a general perception of it and it is something I think we need to fight going forward but I understand that I speak from a point of privilege when it comes to these things and from a point of experience and of dealing with it, not as a victim, but as of more certainly as a bystander. So <clears throat> in, in situations like this, I mean, what, what I understand, like what I have realized is you have to deal with it from a few different places. First of all, the point of complaint and what, what the amount of things that a victim has to go through to come and lodge a complaint. And very often I find that even if it's a police station or if the victim comes to a lawyer, that there is not enough empathy in that situation to understand how much of courage it has taken a person to come forward to that point. Because the person, that victim is fighting patriarchy, that person is fighting so social stigma, that person is fighting uh, her parents most often most of the time because her parents don't want that stigma of uh, going to courts and this concept of washing the dirty laundry in the open and uh, all that sort of thing. So, and also I think something that we also, we need to take into account is it, it doesn't always start with physical abuse. It, star it starts with mental abuse, I'm, as I'm sure y you are, as, as, as in your profession that you would have got to know. So. It, you, you, that person feels worthless, you mentally break that person down, then it, it's, it's a power play, right? So the courage 
that it takes for a person to come forward to that point to take action is you need to appreciate that and if if if, if a client comes to a lawyer at that point i think the lawyer it's the lawyer's responsibility to show empathy maybe more so than any other case in, in a situation like this because the law also for some reason deals with domestic abuse because at the end of end of the day if you take the penal code it is assault it is causing grievous hurt it is causing hurt so if any any other person deals with that uh, a victim in that same manner <coughs> there will be a criminal case pursued so the fact the mere fact that if you, when you go to a police station you you, you, you are immediately sent to the women's and children's bureau you're not you're not even sent to it's, it's not even a miscellaneous uh, it's not a criminal complaint right so the fact that the law also chooses to treat it differently and so that person anyway you have this perception of courts and laws and all that sort of there's a delay so in in that situation that person takes a long time you know a lot of courage to come forward and from that point onwards when you go to court you still need to be very sensitive to that person's needs <clears throat> what you disclose how you disclose i mean you always have the option if if it's a very serious case you always have the option of asking the judge to hold it in camera right i mean i I've, i've had situations like i i think i've discussed this with you also uh especially here uh, confidentiality is conf- it confidentiality because now now unfortunately the magistrates court everything is out in the open But court yeah. courts are you know open packed it's it's full so recently not recently so i i had a client um i think she was married about for about 3 years in those 3 years she was assaulted about 150 times to the point that she was dragged downstairs uh she was punched she was thrown out she was thrown out of thrown out of the house all these issues and you know and but then she had consulted someone she had got video of it there was evidence of all that and then they filed a action under the prevention of domestic violence now what is important to understand about that act is that it was designed to prevent there is no punitive uh, component in that act it was only designed in the inc- instance of emergency to stop that assault from happening so because you can only take a protection order so there th- there is nothing to punish the abuser in that situation so much so that under section 13 you can agree to the protection order without admitting guilt mm-hmm. right so so in in any case under section 12 there's a provision where you can ask for the police so in law there's a thing called 13611a 13611b which is commonly known as a b report a b report will be filed by the police under a it's a private plane now under this act you can file either a private plane or a b report so when we went before the judge to ask to go and get her clothes from her house and we said can you give us some police protection to go and take the clothes and then the judge said oh, why does she need police protection so he said she has been assaulted about 150 times in the last 3 years documented no no she doesn't need police protection I, anyway i i don't understand what the problem is if i took this in my chamber i would have sorted this out in 5 minutes and she would have gone back happily and then i said no i want police protection <laughs> and then the judge said no why don't we let her go back and then they can have a chat and this is all happening in open court and so not only does it discourage the victim that victim but the chances are in that courtroom there were a lot more other victims silent victims and what is their idea of how the law would treat what is their incentive to come forward and complain about the abuse that they are receiving because the moment they come mm. they show this courage they take all these steps they engage a lawyer they go to court they file the case and then the judge says no no your problem is not big enough for me it's not it's not important enough because the mere fact that you are married does does not give anybody the right to raise an arm to hit you so in, uh, uh, my my argument is always it is a sort it is a criminal offense whether you are married or not it does not change the fact that you are you have an intention to cause harm but unfortunately in society 
you have so many different factors that come into it and there is i mean but i i believe we are slowly moving forward i think few years ago divorce had the same stigma and like if you were divorced you were you were looked down upon i think that that has slowly uh, evolved and gone away but this this stigma that is associated with abuse where this idea of you know it's okay this has happened and it what most people don't un, like know understand is that it happens down the line right so the 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 reason somebody would abuse is because they would have seen this happen to their parents to their mother and it just gets passed down the line passed down the line and the more you keep hiding it the more you keep validating it it's just going to keep occurring more and more and more so you have to stop it at some point and it doesn't help if if her parents come and says no it, i think she should go back i mean you you get certain parents say like you know what you raise the hand one time that is enough you come home but the victim needs so much support from their friends from the family and that but because the first thing that the would be abuser does is they cut everybody off they cut the family off they cut the friends off so it's 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 the responsibility of so many people even even the family to understand if you are being cut off you need to be more vigilant if you are being cut off the friends have to be more vigilant because these these are things these are the little things that you can pick up on and these are little <coughs> things that you can do but <laughs> the law is there again it's 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 not a, it's not a question of what the law is the law the prevention of domestic violence does its job it is there to get an emergency protection order it does its job you can always choose to punish the perpetrator through the penal code now again there's a misunderstanding between saying that the wife cannot give evidence against a husband the wife can choose not to give evidence against her husband the wife can choose to give evidence against the husband it is a choice it is not a mandatory confidentiality like an attorney client privilege so lots of interesting things to i think discuss going forward but i i feel <coughs> it's it's not a one solution to everything it's it's a lot of moving parts uh that will come to because it's you can't fix it legally only you have to change the mindset of the people you have to un- because there are a lot of women who perpetrate it as well so patriarchy is not limited to men patriarchy is also used by a lot of women because those ideas have been inculcated through generations and generations but there are a lot of things to discuss and these are like some of my general ideas going so forward so this is like a catch 22 situation no huh? absolutely and it's no sh- it's not shocking that we have the highest rate of suicide in the world yes because that sh- seems to be the only hope for these victims it, it it is depressing to a, to a certain extent to see i've had so many clients that come to me I and mean, when you give them advice and they go back and they never come back because they decided to go back and you know it's going to happen and i think in that situation you also have to uh you know you can't push them it it's it's very difficult to push them say no you have to do it you have to do it so you can only advise and sit back and wait so it's very different if it's a friend of mine i'll be like no no you have to do it you have to do it but if it's a client there's only so much more that you can do and especially if you know the parents are seated then you know the parents are going to discourage them <laughs> from going forward because the options are in a situation like this you have to I- go to the police or you have to file a uh, case private claim under the prevention of domestic violence act so isn't the charge gbh no so that is the thing the grievous bodily hurt is a penal code charge mm. so under the prevention of domestic violence act uh, there is there is nothing to essentially punish uh, anyone so it, the most is you have an inquiry and that person will say yes he he did cause so, so that will be used in a divorce proceeding maybe but there's nothing to punish a person for the act sanjana what have you got to add to what mahesh said all this time i want to thank you so much for having me um and i want to thank mahesh actually for acknowledging his male privilege because we don't often see many men who do acknowledge their male privilege and knowing that uh, as a male they have an upper hand in society 
and I agree with you completely on the statement of the weaker sex because even though it is perceived that women are the weaker sex, I think as women here we can completely mm -hmm. agree that there is no such thing as a weaker sex and women are far beyond that and that we are so much stronger than we, than we express our capabilities to be. So when we talk about domestic Correction, violence... but not physically. We can't stand a shot. Yeah, from biologically. No, exactly. Biologically, exactly. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. But there are also some women who can stand up to that. So, you know. <laughs> I <haven't laughs> power to them. them. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, disagree. So, anyway, so moving forward. Uh, domestic violence, uh, also known as intimate partner violence, was first initially brought up in Sri Lanka in a study, I believe, 30 years ago, uh, under the case of a wife abuser. There was a, stu a study that came out. And here we are, surprisingly, sitting 30 years later, still talking about how such a pressing issue it is in today's society. And when you look at domestic violence uh, in Sri Lanka, just like you rightly said, there's so much a stigma attached to it. There is so much of women who don't come forward. And wh what I feel the problem there is, is that we always look to women and say, you must come forward. Of obviously, you're the victim. You have to come forward unless your story won't be heard. But at the same time, it is women who are expected to do everything. Uh, I know when growing up, I was told that as a woman, you have to learn how to behave, you have to learn how to act, to, to talk, to walk, uh, to how to walk on the road, how to talk back to a man. Um, and we were groomed to actually be uh, taught how to be a perfect wife. Um, but we never look at the boys in our family and teach them how to be a perfect husband. And I think that's where patriarchy comes in, is because we always let the man be, the, let the boy be the boy, let the girl always compromise, uh, change herself, and uh, kind of be set for how she should be, rather than she should kind of change herself to um, fit society standards. Whereas, again, the man can do whatever he wants and please and get away with it, right? And to add on to that, I just want to say that also, as women, biologically, just like we spoke, we are, we are considered to be carers and nurturers and we are expected to keep the family together. So in situations when d there is domestic violence, and especially when there's a child involved, uh, women are expected to go through the abuse time and time again just because they uh, think that it will keep the family together if they stay together, to keep it a happy family. But they often forget that the minute the abuse happens, your family is broken, your home is broken. So there's no point putting yourself through it. And I know there have been, over the years, there have been great civil societies and NGOs that have been working towards uh, catering room, making room for, making safe space for women, right, like uh, mine is, and uh, women in need, where I work previously, had the privilege of working for, and I have seen women come in. And uh, one of the major myths about domestic violence is that they often say that uh, they are from rural areas or suburbans, but we know that uh, I, by working there, I've realized that you can find so many high-profile cases from Colombo as well, which just go uh, under the cover because they come from big families and influential families, and you know, media will sensationalize it, etc. So that's one of the myths that I think we should strongly address, uh, saying that you know anyone can go through abuse. And they're tied down often to uh, their financial dependency on the male. That's why they end up staying in marriages of abuse. Uh, because f a domestic violence or abuse does not have to be just physical. It is emotional as well as economic. Um, and it plays, all those factors play such a large role. So, um, and then uh, one thing I do want to add is that um, there was a care study in 2013 that brought, uh, I just want to bring up the statistics on that was that it was on masculinities and the effects of that on gender-based violence. And the reason I'm bringing th this up is because I want to talk about how masculinity plays a role in this gender-based violence towards women, right? So there was a this, in the study, uh, there was a question asked about what m motivates a man to, uh, to uh, like abuse a woman, whether it is even rape in a marriage or outside of a marriage. And 66.5% said that it was their sexual entitlement and 19.6% said that they were fun or bored, so they would abuse or they would har harass or assault a woman. So those numbers are extremely shocking because 66.5% is not a small number mm -hmm. when you consider the statistics. And, uh, and just like you rightly pointed out, patriarchy is not just by the men. Women can easily be uh, what, supportive of patriarchy also because, again, like you said, is when 
time and time we women are told what to do how to behave how to be the perfect wife and s- such comes patriarchy in its role too where it's passed down generation generation saying this is what i was taught so you c- you have to you have to uh, do the same thing but we see now the younger generations are challenging those ideas are challenging those systems and we are standing up against that and saying no enough is enough and that is also why divorce rates are extremely high these days and i don't want to say the older generation but there is a lot of talk about how the millennials are having high divorce rates and yes their divorce rates are high but i would say kudos to the women stepping out of those abusive marriages and saying enough is enough so i think this is very interesting we can definitely talk more about this moving forward so thank you that thank is you. very interesting uh, dinet as a student how has this domestic violence impacted your life and upset you in growing up you are a man you will be a man very soon and take a wife what are your concerns about domestic violence well um the first thing that comes to my mind is a friend of mine recently opened up to me and i've known him for about fi- close to 15 years and it took him 15 years to actually open up about his experience to speak about how he experienced this in his own household and well what this goes on to say is how uncomfortable people believe it is to speak up about domestic violence because as a child let's say the mother does face domestic violence to a certain degree the mother presses it on to the kids saying let's keep the family's problems at home let's not take it outside yeah. we don't want people knowing uh, you know what goes inside because as sri lankans we have this mindset where we are we take pride in a family and in all that we are you see we want to we want to be seen by society as the perfect family as the perfect individuals like we have everything together so we don't want our problems going out um, what i feel is this is an issue that honestly needs to be addressed at the grassroots level itself and i recently came across a beautiful analogy where a man goes when you squeeze an orange what do you get out of it You don't get lime juice, you don't get apple juice, but what you get is orange juice. What you get is what's inside. When it comes to men, society, you know, whitewashes men say when it comes to domestic violence, whitewashes them by saying, "Okay, this is due to maybe drug abuse or alcohol abuse." But to think about it, the root cause of their anger, their pain is none of this, but what's inside. it could be pressure from work it could be some sort of other external pressure and like you said sanjana uh they could be doing it for fun for a thrill for excitement i mean if you do that there is something wrong with it and we need to start addressing these men in sri lanka not just in sri lanka throughout the world are taught to suppress their feelings taught to you know suppress how they think and just work you know be the breadwinner of the family you don't have to talk about your problems what this does is it creates this burning desire inside to somehow put it out through whatever source that's possible and i feel like that's a pretty dangerous topic that too needs addressing and uh, you see it's a primal instinct for us to feel superior to another and maybe assert dominance in certain areas i mean it's embedded in our subconscious women are almost equally as competitive as men but the way the society is structured men have a tendency to show this off more which is why things such as domestic violence is a global issue it's not just limited to sri lanka but the reason why some countries have higher rates and some countries have low is because culture traditions and norms come into play in sri that lanka is, that is where we stand sri lanka exactly um one reason why women choose not to move away from an abuser or perhaps their husband is because of you know the financial difficulty that they might face in the future but at the same time one thing we cannot forget is the religious influence religion has a big role to play because i believe most uh, religions see this as a stigmatized topic as a taboo to you know uh walk away from a marriage and also at the same time women especially divorced and single mothers are you know backsided in society and uh, as mahesh rightfully mentioned um people weave them differently 
let's say you open up to your neighbor about a problem that you have instead of actually providing support providing help there's a big chance they might start gossiping and uh, you know the whole subject could start traveling all about which is something people it, it's something personal it's a sensitive topic so if we could maybe perhaps educate our local community we can start with our family we can start by you know talking to our kids talking to our parents and saying okay if if maybe our aunt or uncle opens up about something let's figure out a way to help them instead of you know ca causing a problem people that are watching this program people who see discussions such as this you all can take immediate action in your community because that is where change starts it starts with you it starts in your immediate surrounding and with that i'd like to open the table for any more inquiries great so the old adage for what whatever happens till death do us part we must stay together <laughs> religious actually the religious <laughs> institutions also have a big responsibility now we go to marini and uh, she will show us her work how she has opened out her refuge center for these uh, abused women and that is free of charge yeah. she is doing it all on her own yeah. her expenses are borne by her what a great deed she has got into thank you uh, minoli um before going on to my shelters i would like to go back to 2005 3rd of october when this uh, uh, beautiful statute saw the light <laughs> of day I, i was working in parliament and uh, with the greatest difficulty i got permission to go and sit in the gallery and watch the debate mm. parliament debate uh, the bill was presented by a man uh, the then minister of justice and supported by a man and then a woman stood up and said what is this bill on uh, prevention of domestic violence according to our culture women drums and slaves have to be beaten so what is this bill this is totally against our sri lankan proud sri lankan culture so we have come a long way since <laughs> then uh, although my said you know there are problems uh, when we go to court uh, still it has uh, no, no, stood the test of time absolutely uh, I, I was very discouraged when I heard that uh, statement. Uh, so uh, we have to look at it holistically. It's not just going to court. On that note, we are going in for a short commercial break. Do not go away. We'll be back shortly. back to talk walk the discussion is getting very heated and very interesting marini de livera will talk to us now about a refuge center the what she has opened out to all this abused victim since the passage of the prevention of domestic violence act in 2005 in parliament we have come a very long way and uh, as mahesh said the protection order gives some sort of relief but we have to look at the problem holistically when a woman is being emotionally verbally physically attacked what does she do where does she find refuge i have been fighting a losing battle trying to have a small space uh, in a parish church of the victim and i have written proposals and suggested but my efforts were in vain Uh, i suggested having a little room uh, in a church with a coffee machine and uh, with some cookies where a woman could come and uh, tell her story or a young girl or 
even a man for that matter could come and tell the story and then there would be parishioners uh, volunteering uh, to listen to them. So, so it wouldn't cost very much and the church if they could give the room for free, it's only a electric kettle and some, a cookie jar that was needed. Uh, but all that fell on deaf ears and uh, then I thought enough was enough and I rented a place uh, and I started taking these people in. The moment uh, I started having this place and uh, uh, giving economic empowerment training to the women so that they are economically empowered even if they decide to leave their husband uh, there, there is income generation for them and their families. Because one of the sad things that I saw was that in especially in low income groups the children are whisked away to a horrible orphanage which as we all know are little hell holes. Uh, it, it's like a children's prison, most of these orphanages. When I was the chairperson of the National Child Protection Authority, I had the power to visit them, to pay surprise visits to these places. And the children suffer every form of abuse in these orphanages. So these children are sent to orphanages and the mother is at the mercy of her relatives and in extreme situations she's on the streets. So now uh, mine is a family strengthening project. The children come along with their mother uh, to our refuge and the other children who do not have mothers or whose mothers are in jail or whatever uh, have a mother figure uh, in, in my refuge who look after the children and they learn uh, social skills, they learn uh, life skills like cooking, sewing, uh, speaking, English language uh, and they talk about their dreams in an orphanage, uh, you don't have dreams, you are just a number, uh, uh, there, there's no one to show you love and affection and, and you cannot speak about your problems at school because usually they have a quota for 25 children and the orphanage has around 65 children. So there's no one to pet you and uh, spoil you a little bit uh, and, and, and they cannot open up. So, so ours is more like a community home. Uh, but I'm doing it with a zero budget with my uh, personal uh, funding and, and with a few uh, well-wishers uh, and uh, we are carrying on. We had uh, uh, two refuges but we had to close down one uh, so, so, so we are having one at the moment and uh, prevention is better than cure so we have our little uh, street theatre group uh, that uh, with a mascot called Bindu bird, a huge blue bird, uh, you would have seen it on the screen, uh, who goes and creates awareness uh, in very simple language, uh, who goes to the communities, who go to the marketplaces outside schools, creates awareness about the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, about human rights, about child rights, uh, about uh, duties. Uh, we always speak of human rights but we forget to uh, speak about duty to other people, duty to the environment, uh, duty uh, to the society, to the community. Uh, uh, so uh, we have a lot to do and it was also discussed that uh, violence uh, takes many forms. Uh, it was heartening that the Prevention of Domestic Violence uh, Act recognized emotional abuse. But there are five types of violence which are physical violence, uh, psychological abuse or emotional abuse, then cultural violence, virginity tests and uh, dowries, <laughs> asking for dowries. If a mother-in-law has uh, two uh, daughters-in-law, uh, she can pass hints to the second girl and say, what did you bring? The first, uh, uh, my uh, older son's uh, wife brought uh, uh, 50 acres of uh, tea, you, you came with nothing. So that is emotional abuse and uh, cultural abuse. We hardly think, but you have to only open the Sunday newspaper marriage proposal column to see how much uh, we rely on dowries. We say, oh, we are not like India, there are no dowry debts, but there's a very subtle form of cultural violence. So how do we address all this? Uh, sadly to say, the Sri Lanka Law College does not have human rights as a subject and lawyers are not uh, trained, there is no gender sensitization. Uh, we, we are taught to be very mercenary and <laughs> uh, we, we are not trained to be lawyers with a heart. 
So, those changes have to be made and also at community level we have to educate the people and from preschool onwards we have to uh, uh, train uh, children to be good human beings and to tr uh, treat others with a sense of dignity. You have opened the Pandora's box. <laughs> I think we all have to contribute towards it and the viewers must take note of all what is happening and saying in this, in this talk show because they, it is of so vital importance that so many things we didn't know, we are not aware of what these victims go through daily per se. Mm. Anything else that you have to add to this? No, exactly. Uh, what, one thing I found interesting was how it was a woman itself that opposed the PDCA bill when it was <laughs> brought up. You see, this goes on to show how much people you see, we are seen as lions, Sri Lankan lions. We take pride in it. We are strong, a dominant race. The, this is exactly why we are very sensitive about speaking about the LGBTQ community. We fear that if we speak yeah. up about it, if we bring it to the limelight, yeah. there's a chance it could weaken our community. Yeah. We see these as cancers. So, so, yeah. And that's exactly why we don't speak up about it. And the other thing is the participation of religious institutions, which I really feel strongly about. Because we hear complaints, we see parish priests, monks continue to say that the youth is, you know, moving away from religion, they're moving away from spirituality. But sure. the, the thing is, children aren't really interested in going through scriptures anymore. They want solutions to practical issues. That's how the exactly. modern day youth is coming up. So if religion institutions, like you said rightfully, if they helped in an initiative such as yours, imagine the amount of influence they'd be making on society. People would automatically be attracted. You wouldn't have to call them to come, jo yeah. come join us, come listen to our sermons. People would love to come because you're actually making change. Religious leaders choose rather to step into politics than make change in mm, the local community. They have a huge influence over a mass number of people. Because from birth itself, all of us are, you know, allocated to a certain religion. Mm. So our religious leaders do have that power, that privilege to actually make change in our lives. Why have they been silent all this time? Maybe it's time they opened up their eyes and started addressing these, which would actually capture the youth. They could bring back the youth. Mm. They could increase the youth spirituality along the way as well. It's a perception no, that we got to change. Yes, what we right. think, the reality is different. So what we perceive, we have to change. And I, as uh, quite rightly you said, the religious institutions must start. Yes. Every religious institution has a power to do it for the youth of this country, for everybody, for all of us. No, exactly. When you brought up this topic, of uh, domain, when you presented it to me, the first thing that came to my mind was, how effective is the law? Is law where we can find an answer for this? But that's when I actually stepped into the whole religious thing. Because you see, people, according to our cultures, according to the norms that are built in Sri Lanka, women, children, they have a fear of speaking up because they know if they speak up about it, once they go back home, there's a chance the husband could beat them up more because of this. So because of that, they choose to stay silent, stay, uh, stay as silent victims. And you see, the neighbors can't really intervene as well because privacy is then compromised. Mm -hmm. People believe, okay, if the neighbors are having problems, honey, step out of it. It's not our problem. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, stick, stick on our grounds. That's it. But if we can promote it in a way where, okay, if, if it's going overboard, maybe someone can intervene. Maybe someone can step in and silently have a conversation. They might deny it at first, but give them moral support. You know, you don't exactly have to give them an option out of it, but be there. If, if they're going through, you know, constant abuse and they have no way out, open up your door for them so they can come at least spend a few minutes, cool down, take care of themselves and go. You can make change from that level as well. Do you agree that in Colombo especially, yes. you sometimes don't know who your neighbor is? Yeah, is it's such huh? a... There problem. is no community care, there is no caring for each no. other. You have to think that, you know, in an emergency, yeah. first comes your neighbor, yeah. but which we fail to realize, yeah. not myself, but most people, 
stay aloof. They don't want to have anything to do with neighbors. But if there's but something that's, uh, that happens like gossip, that oh, gets yes. sensationalized. Yeah. Yeah. The minute you know your neighbor and everything <laughs> goes away. Well. That is understood. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. True. Growing up, one thing I found very interesting was in our neighborhood, we used to have this, you know, annual Aurudu event where all oh, the kids lovely. would come together, yeah. where the families would come together, yeah. but it just happened two years. Ah, that's it. Then that's it died when it ended. It just died out. <laughs> but I, I really wish things like this would be promoted. So people mm. would actually get to know people. I mean, yeah. you cause gossip, jealousy and yeah. all is created when you don't know an individual. Yeah, that's right. When you personally you don't understand. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you personally know, know someone, them. there's a chance for you to empathize more with them. Yeah. There you are, viewers. Start now. Get to know your neighbor. Just gonna Plan something once a month, once in six months, mm. together with your neighbours. Have a little chat, mm. have over a cup of tea and a mm. biscuit, that's mm. enough. Yeah. But uh, I don't know whether this is the rat race is overtaking all this. Yeah. I have no time for this, I have no time for the other. And this is overtaking all of us, our lives, and are pretty boring mm. for some. And we are all engulfed in this. It, it is interesting. I mean, like now that you, like we are, since you bring up the religious aspect of it also, I and mean, if you take um, even the Catholic Church, and I'm a, I'm a Catholic myself, but it's the stigma attached to divorce, yeah. and how much it causes people to stay in an abusive relationship. Now, I'm I'm not talking about the unhappy uh, marriages where you don't have anything in common. That's not what I'm talking. I'm talking about in a situation where you are actively encouraged to stay in a marriage where you are being abused. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you get divorced, you are blacklisted by the church. <laughs> you can't get married again in church. Uh, if you can't receive sometimes, some uh, uh, priest won't give you communion. Mm -hmm. And that is a core fundamental part of your faith, right? So mm -hmm. if you are if you're taking that away, so the church is indirectly punishing you mm -hmm. for defending Being yourself. Abused. The church is yes. indirectly punished. So if your community doesn't help you, yeah. so your neighbor is not going to help, help you. you, your church is not going to help yeah. you, your parents don't want to help you. And this is why I, 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 I always, when, when, whenever I have been uh, asked to come and speak on this topic, I always say I am never going to ask the victim to be more brave. Because that I, I, that person is doing a lot for that person to come out for us to know that story. That means that victim has been brave. So there is there is no situation there. You should tell the person no, do this, do this more. You know it, that that is just so counterproductive. When there are so many other aspects that you can actually you know help. And mm -hmm. like we were talking about the act also, the only offences under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act is if you publish. Anything related to, to that, that yeah. it is an offense, yeah. right? If you publish, which means that is there to protect both the victim, which and is in fairness, perpetrator. but also so the, the perpetrator, perpetrator yeah. right? You can't publish anything. Mm. And number two is if you violate the order. Now, in theory, that's all well and good, right? But the problem is if when you go to court with evidence of abuse, with police reports, with pictures, and the court still has difficulty in understanding the gravity of the situation, what are your chances of convincing them of emotional abuse? Mm. Now you Very see difficult. it and you still can't convince them. Mm. How difficult I mm. is it to convince them of emotional mm. abuse? Right? And that is in a prevention of domestic violence act. My contention is these are penal offences. Mm. But that is the law. right? But the practical situation is when there are kids involved, I don't want my child's hus my my child's father to go to jail, so I'm not going to take yeah. that action. Mm -hmm. That is such a common uh, occurrence. Right? I don't want him to go to jail. Mm -hmm. So, question: Either you divorce that person, live with the stigma; you defend yourself, mm -hmm. live with the stigma, or you go back and be mm -hmm. abused. So, that that is where I feel that everybody else has to come in and help, right? And like. People all around, like your parents, your cousins, your friends, your 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 neighbors, and like most most of the time, like neighbors don't want to get involved because they think there'll be a court case mm -hmm. and they'll have to be witnesses. witnesses. And that is an entirely mm -hmm. different issue with 
like how the court system works and how long it mm. takes and like you don't want to do that and the moment you even the moment you come to uh, the moment you come to court and they are going to be vilified mm. you are going to it's going to be played to the gallery you are a loose woman you did mm. not listen to what i had to say you provoked mm. so those are common arguments that come up in court so it's sometimes i just feel it's like such a <coughs> loose loose situation for uh, everybody concerned and you can't blame the victims for not coming forward because there is no viable alternative i mean the work you do is fantastic but it is as you said you don't have the funding no. it's very limited and it's a very limited amount of people who will have access to it mm. and surprisingly even in colombo people who have the resources they stay in that marriage for other reasons <laughs> right not not necessarily economic reasons but the fact that your social standing and all that sort of thing so if the people who have the resources don't do it then what are the chances that people who are actually you know destitute will do it yeah. but the sad thing is that they stay in the marriage when they are so unhappy right and take it out of every other woman through their frustrations which is so and unfair without walking away from mm. a situation they stay in it and yeah. stewing in it and be uh, abusive to others that cross their path mm. that is very boring the mm. tlc that you offer the victims mm. what is so commendable they are so proud of what you are doing marini i wish the people who are listening know the amount of time and energy you are putting for all yeah. these poor victims yeah. they have a place to go to yeah and each person we have to tailor a package uh, according to their needs we ask It's them what the they want to do yeah, yeah. yeah we have to give them training some yeah. want continuing education and some need medical care some women are pregnant we have to take them to the clinic so all that we have to spend on travel we have to spend on train staff uh, it's not easy managing no. the staff there, no. there has to be confidentiality and then uh, they, they have their court cases on different days yeah. and it's, so it's that i cannot go for every single yeah, court appearance so there's uh, <laughs> no pro bono culture in this country yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i just want to add to that like it is extremely commendable the work you are doing and uh, we create so much of safe spaces for this women but how long can this go on for right like how many women are you able to when you support on on your free will how where are you going to look for funding we need political and yes. uh, political support in every neighborhood well there should be government a shelter funding and government has refused time and regardless of the government you can be either liberal or on the right wing or the left wing but the government year by year has been refusing to give uh, funding for safe space like yeah. is your or the, the buildings were there the buildings were there they are neglected and uh, exactly uh, I, I, they, they no, have been I, occupied i also find it hilarious <laughs> that we stick to this culture that we have because the british took like you know yeah. came here gave us victorian values yeah we have now embraced it as if yeah, it yeah. is our own culture <laughs> and they have discarded and now they it, have discard. moved on and they have like <laughs> yeah. been progressive yeah, but we are still sri lankan yeah. it's not sri lankan culture it's victorian values <laughs> that we have yeah, that's right yeah. and it's it's the victorian stiff upper lip that we are yeah. promoting uh, it, it's not the, the sri lankan culture community involvement oh. approach and no. not this no, uh, no, no. type it's, it's, of it's, very and, and no, even if you take even if you take the candian it's not the it was very matriarchal it yeah, wasn't exactly. patriarchal, patriarchal. Yeah. right so you now you have taken a for, now for everybody who shouts about foreign influence and this yeah, and yeah. that we have taken a foreign culture That's that right. we are promoting as our own exactly. and the the sad part of it 52% of this country is suffering because of that culture yeah now the orphanages is a very british thing they have a boarding schools for girls yes. they were converted into converted orphanages in, yeah. we never had orphanages uh, prior to the british yeah. it it was the neighbor if the mother died it was the neighbor or the mother sister who looked after the child yeah. now now there are little prisons uh, that are called yes. orphanages child yeah. development centers and horrendous things happen inside them and nobody knows what happens no that too one thing i realized was <laughs> there's no proper monitoring or controlling mechanism also no, installed yes. when it yeah. comes to the so yeah. now we don't even have a ministry so exactly yeah. <laughs>
So, and the most ironic thing when you come when you talk about culture is that we immediately stand up and say that if if I am a woman and I stand up against abuse or any other form of harassment and I go to courts about it and I talk to senior people about it, they like you're going against our culture. Gotcha. Yeah. Immediately, that's what they say. But our cult, when you look at our culture, right, right, like yeah, you point out, is very matriarchal. When you look yeah. at the Canadian society, and women were always kept at uh, the most highest point, and they were always treated with enough respect. But what do we teach our younger generation now? We only instill uh, we all our religions like when we talk about religions and cultures is that everyone all religions believe the same to be kind no violence love mm -hmm. everything but what do we teach now we don't teach any of that we don't teach we don't teach how to respect one another we don't teach how to treat people with empathy because those are the things that we lack as a society mm -hmm. how many issues we've had over the past so many years just based on race mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. differences yeah, yeah. in that it all boils on that and we meant to this day how much ever we talk about leadership as women in this country, women are still treated as second class citizens. Women every day for, uh, go through some form of abuse, whether it is uh, harassment on the road or definitely in their homes. And women are the economic uh, backbone of our country. And how do you expect them to be at 100% efficiency if they don't have safety in their own homes? So we always, so again, we go to create safe spaces for these women, but we really need to look at the law. Is the law really protecting each citizen of this country as it is supposed to? We have to go in for the short commercial break again. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Talk Walk. It's question time. Yes, we do agree we don't have support system or a welfare system. What do you think the solution should be for this problem? Civil society and uh, government institutions should work hand in hand. If now there is a budgetary allocation for women and children from the treasury, where does it go? How is it spent? And who gets what? In other countries, civil society organizations are funded by the government. Even in India, their child helpline is run by a civil society organization. It's called Childline and a very effective system, helpline. But in Sri Lanka, NGOs and civil society organization are, organizations are frowned upon by the government and uh, they don't have memorandums of understanding and they don't collaborate and work together. What else do you think the solution should be? We are inhuman to begin with, I think, that we don't care for children. We were all children at some stage of our lives. And what these children are going through, please have a heart. Remember what they are, we have to find a solution and it has to be quick. What do you think the legal implications, so how we can find supportive systems for this? So it, it's, it's very difficult to say because if you're looking at a holistic solution, you can't just say legal because it, nothing, nothing can be solved by law alone if you do not have the will to mm -hmm. solve it right so for instance now today in the morning before i came i saw it's not even education because like i saw someone who's very educated uh, who has runs his own business and he had said like uh, there was a status about under representation in the parliament and he said if it was 52 percent of the women in Sri Lanka, uh, voters are women. Why have they not voted more women in? So my point is, if you can't understand how patriarchy works and the effects of it, and it, it's not necessarily every single woman getting up and saying, "Oh, I'm going to vote for a woman," it, the education has to start 
at that point of break in the boundaries mm -hmm. that are already there so if educated people cannot understand that those boundaries exist and it's merely oh woman should vote for woman if if it is as simple as that then we wouldn't be in this situation mm -hmm. because it is not as simple as that that is the reason we are in this situation and if if the educated people in sri lanka can't understand that then what hope do you have when you go to the rural areas where are your thought it is the right of the husband to beat you yeah. mm. right so if a person can't understand patriarchy there's no hope so he can't stay here and call out the rural woman for not voting for woman when he himself does not understand the need to break the boundaries right so you can't just say it is a legal issue so i believe in a legal sense there should be ramifications for assault maybe not an amendment to the domestic violence act because the problem the reason even the victims are willing to go forward and file the cases because they believe at the end of it the husband the mm. father of their child is not going to be punished mm. and that is one of the main reasons for them to file the case and get that protection order in the interim but the protection order is only valid for one year okay, so if you yeah. don't get divorced in that one year yeah, yeah. it will lapse it will lapse and and there are practical issues about space mm. can can somebody in a rural household yeah go somewhere else yes. can he throw can she throw the husband out Onto just the because there is a protection order under the street right yeah. uh, then 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 the issue becomes something about oh right okay you're getting the protection order what about my child and very often the as much as it is in divorce proceedings it becomes a custody issue and it become the child becomes a bargaining chip with yeah. uh, in uh, to uh, validate the protection order so what happens in so th there are certain amendments that you can make to the prevention of domestic violence act it's basically not make it a maintenance action or a custody action mm -hmm. right because that that's a separate court for that the judges have to be educated the judges have to be educated they have to be given training in sensitivity yeah. not only the male judges mm. female judges as well Th there has to be that and i believe there has to be training for the lawyers because lots of people still don't use this act it's very very yeah. few amount of people who still very, just a handful of just a handful of people oh. who use this act and they still don't have an understanding of the act what is the purpose of this yeah. act it is it is not there to punish it is there mm. to protect people right so i in that situation the lawyers have to be educated they have to be given training in sense that is very right to say because it's this is this is this is a larger issue with gender based behavior that we have in this country this is just one component of it right i mean like there's like yeah. leads to sexual uh, you would know in the legal profession the issues yeah, that yeah. that are there but you know this is just one component of it but the gender based uh, sensitivity uh, judges train in sensitivity and a basic understanding of the the courage that a victim will have to come to that position to stand in front of you and say i am being beaten in the context of larger social context larger social yeah. issues in sri lanka yeah. so in that you, so you can't just say it's the law i i don't think it's a problem with you can always mm -hmm. improve upon the law but it is an understanding of what the law entails and the surrounding circumstances for everybody involved in the judicial process so I, it, it's not just a legal issue don't you think that the judges should be working with psychologists so that they understand oh. the trauma the victims oh. go through i don't think they have any clue no. of the trauma no no i mean if you had any clue of the trauma you wouldn't say come to my room and i'll sort it out in 5 minutes when when that person had been and there was a video right so there was a video of that person being beaten put on the bed and hammered so in that situation for that judge to stand there and say if i took it in the chambers i would sort it out in five minutes so what are you sorting out mm. what are you sorting out his way or no other way <laughs> that's what he's going to say but it, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a he yeah. but <laughs> oh, he, or, he or a she whoever <laughs> yeah but you know what are, what are you going what are you, what, what are you sorting and if i may add to what mahesh said as even though the pdva is in place since 2005 only 1% of victims have actually taken action using that act yeah. uh, not many even go seeking a protection order because not only do we need to sensitize the judges and the lawyers we need to sensitize the most basic uh, 
protection officers who are police officers who are who will be the first in chain for them to go and report violence to and if the police officers stand there and say uh, no call your husband i will set uh, you know fix your i will help you guys fix your marriage up and not give respect the woman who's standing there abused and willing to send her back mm -hmm. home with the husband who's potentially going to abuse police her even okay. further for coming to the police in the mm -hmm. first place mm -hmm. how is that we are not going to make change if we don't sensitize the police, police. officers to understand where these this abuse is coming from where these victims are coming from and more than just that i think what what else we have to do is that sensitize everyone not just the people who act in the law right if each and every one of us we need law to make sure that we are able to talk to our families uh, we are able to talk to our friends and get help when we need to because that like again uh, ties down Youth a lot groups. to st stigma yes. Youth Youth groups. Groups. and uh, again unfortunately the police are very desensitized uh, well, these these but there has been training uh, I, I, the civil yeah, society have been working uh, that's and they've set up say. police desks at hospitals where victims Those can be easily I seen. actually in in the last the in, in, in the last 10 yeah. years though I have noticed a change in yeah. the general behavior of mm. the police yes. they've been a lot more sensitive but it's also it's like the moment they leave it will be like ah what has happened oh mm. show me the case show me the pictures how had they hit it's 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 a source it's of trauma. gossip inside yeah. the and it's trauma for the victim right it's, like it's she has relive the moments over and over it's again really, it's really it's revictimization right yeah. it, that that's that's what it is but but the issue is i i do see a change in the police but it yeah. it has to i don't think civil society and as, as much as you have done i don't yeah. think you can do it alone no, I, you, you, you you need government yeah, yeah. help and and the fact that and it and it has to be and the general public also has general public so be very vocal so about it the general if the general public is vocal about it then they will have political will exactly. i think yeah. i i discussed this when we had the other political will comes from what it yeah. i think the we have to people, move past the, the idea that the politicians will do something because it is the right thing to do i think yeah. we have to get comfortable with the idea that they will do it because the public wants them demand, to do it yeah. there's a demand for it so in that situation it is up to us it is up to each and yeah. every one, one of, of us, us to be to vocal be. talk about yeah. it present our ideas yeah. and make it worthwhile for the politicians to act upon it yeah. but let's be real not everyone is going to speak up about it unless no. of course it affects them because everyone mm. has some form of privilege mm -hmm. like even though i am being vocal about domestic violence i do not know anyone close to me or myself have experienced it and i understand that from my place of privilege i am using my point of privilege to speak up about it yeah. and voice it for people who do have face it but each and every one is not going to act responsibly if, if each citizen was a responsible citizen our country would, would be, be yeah, heaven absolutely. on earth exactly <laughs> so you know we would be yeah. somewhere else it would be right the now. ideal country to live in yeah. utopia right <laughs> So right. no it is not but that shouldn't stop us from striving right. to exactly. achieve exactly yes we and that's why so schools yes. universities and, and in most cases of social that. issues it's always civil society and private sector funding that gets something moved the government never does enough to actually cater to, to the actual needs of the citizens like women have been voicing issues for years now how much has been done by the government no, to support organizations that actually cater to the needs of these mm. so you know there has to be some it can't be just a campaign thing that you stand no. on and saying i'm going to support, support women yeah. but when you're elected when in you're elected, where you where is your about. exactly the, the sad thing is if you put the processes in place and ensure the funding runs through there are enough people outside to help the government run it yeah. it's just those first few steps that you have to do and take it and and actually set it up Right. The so processes are there. There's a gender complaint unit in the national committee. No, no. What I'm saying is, you actually uh, do the funding, funding. put the it's people the in. It's the funding and the yeah. political will that. And also yeah. awareness. Like I didn't awareness. know about this uh, gender thing that you just spoke about. Like you know, we don't know. Do we know that there's a women and children helpline that was set up by the ministry yeah, two, one, three years yeah. ago? No. Not many people. I think nineteen. Three eight, three eight, right? Yeah. I don't think many people know about but that, and that it's a free. But that functions only uh, during the day, they working hours. So the no, last year they made it twenty. Meeting happens after uh, six yeah, p.m. Exactly. Last year they made it twenty four hours, uh, I think, no, I, and I, 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 I don't even think it's functions. I think, think, think functions. the lock. I think the lockdown though <laughs> did bring this slight. lead to the attention of the public but not enough no. but, but again if a civil society was yeah, stepped exactly. in yeah exactly and yeah. and, 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 and social media yeah and social media yeah. activists advocates and, they stepped up and uh, and i think you you have to use whatever medium is available exactly. if yeah. it's if it is social media to highlight yeah. these things do it and you know what if you if somebody has beaten someone if you're going to talk about it if it's going to be out there let it be out there mm. right and and there is no excuse 
for raising your hand yeah. and abusing someone. Mm. There is no excuse, right? So, if there is evidence, it, let it be out. That's be educated on it. Understand why it happens. I'm not saying persecute those people. See that that is like one of the issues that I had with this whole hashtag Me Too. The media blitz. Yeah. Me Too is fantastic. It yeah. gave people courage to come out. But I am not in favor of trial by media. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It 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 it, no. it leads. It gives very dangerous precedence yeah. as to what whatever because you can. Warriors uh, yeah, come out. Yeah, and all these. It's, it's a court of social media. It's a court of social, <laughs> and it's it, yeah. it's it's not it's not healthy. It's not healthy it's for not, a justice yeah. system to have something like that. But I think we need to understand why it came uh, about. Yeah. People are resorting why to it because, it, why no it because that's about. the only way that things <laughs> yeah. go viral, and yeah. you, you get the attention yeah. of the mainstream. Harvey Weinstein yeah. would never have been, uh, yeah. you know, prosecuted. Bill Cosby would have never been prosecuted. Bill O'Reilly would have never been let go of his job. These are very high. I mean, Donald Trump is still there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a different story. But what I'm saying is, if why these things come out is because this, our system is not working. And as much as I am against these public persecutions, I also understand why it's happening. Mm-hmm. Right, it's very easy. Like as it stands now, if you if you accuse someone publicly, it's it's very difficult, right? Even if you're not innocent, you can always have false accusations. Yeah, but yeah. false accusations are a minority of all the actions. So there's right. you you can't say, oh, that two percent is a false false complaint. So everything mm. should be discounted. So these are things I think we need to you know look at and understand and discuss mm-hmm. going forward. But as it, as it stands now, like it help where you can. Yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah. Before we wind up, if I could actually uh, bring in a micro suggestion to all the viewers as well, especially when it came to my friend's case, I saw the signs, but I wasn't aware of them at the time because I, wa- I was not educated. Mm-hmm. And like you said, the he- women's hotline as well, you can't really say you aren't aware in this generation. Please take it up as a personal responsibility mm. to, you know, get yourself yeah. aware yeah, yeah, yeah. about these things, about yeah, yeah. these help hotlines, at yeah. the same time, about the signs that show. Responsible citizens. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because while the child, while the youth especially, while the parents deal with the problems at home, the child comes to school, you might meet him in the playground, etc. If you can see, th- because I did see the signs when he came to my friends. He used to have these violent outbursts mm-hmm. out of nowhere. And he used to stay angry most of the time. He used to, you know, uh, stay separated from the class at Mm. certain uh, instances. And I never approached him because I didn't know he had such a problem. Problem. But if I was aware at the time, I could have been of more assistance. I could have helped him. Because trauma you receive as a young kid Mm. grows by leaps and bounds as you grow up. So we can avoid this if we can be of assistance to the youth so please take it up as a personal responsibility to educate yourself and be more aware of this. Really, what about the teachers? No, I know in other countries, in the sta- uh, United States and all that, like for instance, if you notice the drawings of a child, mm. exactly. depict, then you have to kick it up the chain. How does it, how in, does it work? In uh, divi- every division and secretariat, there's a child protection officer okay. who is supposed to work with the teachers in the local schools. Okay. I don't know how far it was <laughs> happening during my <laughs> tenure. Okay. As chairperson of National Child Protection Authority, okay. we had projects, and I used to fund from Colombo all the schools in the country. Okay. Uh, because uh, through uh, the it, child it protection. works, right? So the, yes. the moment they so, notice something, so we used to give them materials, the posters, uh, what to do, and we used to have competitions among the schools and that okay. kind of thing. I don't know what it has happened now. After That's that. how we rate. <laughs> If you give a child a drawing, drawing. to do, mm-hmm. yeah. we, through the drawing we rate their mental status. Yeah. For yeah. corporal the punishment we need that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was a Catholic school and most of them drew a priest <laughs> with a cane. <laughs> and, and then we had to hide it because uh, the children were saying, we'll give it to you but don't show it to Father <laughs> <laughs> That can be one of four schools. And I just want to quickly <laughs> add that uh, most children who do grow up watching this trauma or yeah. even abused as children, there's an article on The Guardian that said that 30 to 40 percent of these children end up being abusers themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So that is something that children and the younger generation nowadays should bre- work towards to breaking break that chain. And that's really extremely only important. only way to break that chain is through psychological support. Exactly. Yeah. So when there's no psychological support, the no. abuser becomes It's coming though. During COVID, through. we saw yes. Sri Lanka has yeah, become more sensitive to it. counselor, but uh, 
Uh, uh, but the subjects are taught during that time. No, but that is why I wanted to check with you as yeah, to whether, yes. you know, how, uh, how the, often. There, there, there was a system in place, <coughs> I don't know about yeah. the current situation. Okay. I'm afraid on that note, we have to wrap up this series. See you next Wednesday, same time, 6.30 p.m. on our television's Talk Walk. Thank you for watching. Before I, before I sign off, for every wound, there is a scar. And every scar tells a story, a story that says we survived. This is for the victims. This is Minoli Di Almeida signing off.